Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Historians episode here on the channel. I am your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. Joining me today is a guest with a very, very long record. 32 years in his professional field, which includes textual, choreographic, and microfilm records, as well as cre cre <laughs> creation work in project development, research, fabrication, writing, public outreach for exhibits, and many more. Also a published author with four releases to his credit, he is also a lifelong sports historian and wants to write several books on sports history before he is through. Joining us today for the first time on the channel is Matthew Matt DiBiaz. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Gabe. It's a great honor and a privilege. Thank you. You're welcome, Matt. Now, before we jump into the questions, uh, what can you tell us more about your background? Well, okay. I was uh, born and raised in Southern New Jersey. Um, I went to school, uh, went my schools there, mostly in the Burlington County area. I, uh, my college experience was at the Univer uh, Rutgers University, Camden College of Arts and Sciences, where I got my bachelor's and master's degree there. Uh, world hit, my bachelor's was in world history with a political science minor and my master's was in American history with the emphasis on archival studies. I wanted, my desire was always to work in an archival field, in the archival field, or museum or archival field. And um, two months after I got my master's degree, I was hired by the National Archives at Philadelphia, which is a regional branch of the National Archives located in Washington, DC. And I have worked there ever since. Wow, holy mackerel, talk about Living dream, and that's actually funny you brought that up because that was actually for a long time my dream to actually work in the archival records. I mean, that is crazy. So, where would you probably say history was probably the field that you wanted to pursue growing up? Where did that spark come from? Oh, as early as I was at the age of 10, um, history, um. Uh, so my ancestry, especially my maternal ancestry, we go back a long way. Uh, my mother was from the South. And so uh, my, my mother's ancestors can be traced back to the colonial period. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of history there. Uh, I, I loved reading about history books. I mean, uh, my family was a bunch of family of readers. We had a very extensive library there. My father was always into hit military history, sports history. You know, World War II, the Civil War. Uh, we, I, my family were a bunch of Civil War buffs, and I remember wow. when I was just four years old. My mother took me to Appomattox Courthouse, so I always had that fascination. I've always been. We used to, we used to love watching documentaries as a child. There, um, you know, World at War and various other things. Before you had like the History Channel or things like that. Whenever there was a good documentary, we were always right there in front of the TV set, devouring it eagerly. <laughs> And also sports history too. When I was 10 years old, I could recite all the World Series winners from 1903 to 1973. Uh, I just, I had a trick memory, not total recall, but if it interested me, instant total retention, but if it bored me in one ear, out the other. Wow, yeah. holy mackerel, that is incredible. And I got to kind of lead into the next set of questions, uh, which is now focusing on your, uh, work in the archival field. So what project would you say in the beginning of this incredible journey for you was probably the most fascinating for you? Hmm. Well, mo what we do, I'll explain to the, our, our audience. Uh, we're, like I said, I work for a regional branch of the National Archives. Everyone knows about the famous National Archives in downtown Washington, D.C. However, the National Archives has many branches throughout the country. We have uh, 13 regional branches located up in New England, New York City, uh, Philadelphia, where I work, um, the greater Atlanta, Georgia area, Fort Worth, Texas, Denver, Colorado, two in California, one in the greater Los Angeles area, one in the greater San Francisco area, Seattle, uh, Chicago, uh, in and around St. Louis. Also, all presidential libraries are part Whoa. of the National Archives uh, 
uh, experience. Also, we have uh, military history, military service records are housed in our facilities in the greater St. Louis area, uh, so on and so and so on and so forth. So we are a, a, quite a far reaching organization, even though we're a small staff, especially at my locale, we're very small. We, we, our clientele is we serve not just the whole country, but the world. We do get requests from abroad, uh, like for our naturalization records or sometimes scholarly research. Like we have a, a gentleman from Germany who is doing research about the U-boat campaign in World War II, and he's looking up old merchant ship records uh, to see if they were attacked by U-boats, so on and so forth. Uh, I remember one time, um, the chief in 1999, 98, 99, the chief historian of the Royal Mint of the Netherlands flew from the Netherlands to Philadelphia to look at record group 104, which are records of the U.S. Mint pertaining to uh, the U.S. Mint lending Lend-Lease gold to the Dutch government in exile during World War II. He was Whoa. so happy with what we had. He actually wrote my director a letter of commendation for our efforts in assisting him. Holy mackerel, that is incredible. So pretty much, like the National, Ar National Archives is literally like the largest library in the world where pretty much everyone just come to just do research and like gather information. I mean, that's incredible. I would imagine going into that for the first time, it counts a little intim intimidating, I would think, to like be a part of this. Were you ever intimidated when you first joined? No, 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 but intimidated. It's a question of... It takes time to know what we have and what we don't have. In the beginning, I was kind of, oh, we couldn't possibly have this, but actually uh, I learned to the contrary. And I, so I never learned to say, no, we don't have that. You, you'd be amazed at what we have. I mean, we have like um, uh, all U.S. district court records for those five states in our jurisdiction. For the rec ladies and gentlemen, for the National Archives in Philadelphia, our jurisdiction covers those permanently retained federal records from those agencies residing in the states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and West Virginia. The full range of federal agencies from the U.S. District Court to like the Environmental Protection Agency to the U.S. Mint uh, to like military installations like the Norfolk Naval Shipyard or the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. We have some like Army installation records, uh, uh, various Army installations within our five state jurisdiction like federal highway administration records. Sometimes it's very mundane, seldom mm. used, but the, like the full range of federal agencies are covered here, uh, you know, from the military to like U.S. wildlife surveys, um, uh, to the, our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we get a lot of, sometimes those agencies reach out to us because they need to look at some very old records because they having to update certain little truck projects like dredging, uh, U.S. Coast Guard records from merchant vessel ships. Like we just had some gentlemen come in like a couple weeks ago. They were looking at um, personnel records from U.S. lifeboat saving stations within that was at the 5th Coast Guard District there along the New York and New Jersey Shore installations there. And we, we, we they were there for a whole week and they came away so happy. You know, they were getting they were getting records there. Wow. Yes. Wow. 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 I mean, that's incredible. I mean, I probably went to, oh, I don't know if I went to the National Archives in D.C. I remember walking past it with my school group back in uh, high school, but even still, just the thought and just seeing the National Archives, it's just incredible. I mean, it houses so much information. And I can't even imagine, you know, the men and women who uh, are part of this to, like, the research that has to go into it, which kind of leads into the next question is, when you first joined the National Archives in Philadelphia, what was sort of the promise that you're making to yourself in the sense of being a part of this? Because I would imagine the mindset as an archival historian is a little bit different from your typical historian. Yes, it is about preserving information and recording information, but for archival work, it's slightly different. Yes, I mean, it was for me, it was always a dream come true. I mean, my motto is it beats working for a living. <laughs> it's, it's love. It's, I wasn't going in and to be me, me, Mr. Mega Millions or anything like that. No, 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 no. You, you love the craft. 
you love the challenge of do we have what the customer needs okay usually they have an idea they were told yes it, it, what you're looking for is at our facility here and if we don't have it at our specific facility we constantly refer people to the appropriate whatever appropriate archival uh, narrow facility would have what it is they want we forward things all the time you know just it was just an innocent mistake okay no you thought we had it no actually it's at this location here and we, we send the request to the appropriate uh, facility and all of that so or in, even if it's not a, a national archives record we refer them to like the appropriate state agency or appropriate county court what they're looking for especially in terms of naturalization records you know genealogical research and we sometimes they do that no they weren't naturalized in a federal court they were done in a local county court so we said ah. please contact uh this county courthouse or that county courthouse and so on wow so yeah. Pretty much, you guys just direct people to like the appropriate um, centers to really give them all the information. I would imagine to memorize all that stuff, it takes a lot of training, a lot of skill to like have everything together. And I say that because it is a lot of information to like have everything. I mean, it's the National Archives. It houses all the information from around the world and here in the States. And I guess if you're not prepared for that kind of studying and kind of information taking it can kind of overwhelm you um did you know people growing up or not growing up but like in that field when you started who may have been burned out or may have given you some tips of how to you know not feel overwhelmed or intimidated i never felt over no, i never felt overwhelmed i remember my first boss dr robert plowman uh he he's long since passed away may god rest his soul a, ma a magnificent one of the greatest men i ever knew uh, he was like a second father to me. He showed me the way a man named Mr. Joe Sheehan. He was one of my early directors. He, he exposed me. He, he taught me, you know, the, how to deal with the systems, you know, write, compose the proper letters of response, how to work within the guidelines of how we, uh, how we operate and all that very good hands-on training. But I think the best training is just simply doing the work day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And after a time, you just you just absorb it all. You learn by the doing. And once you learn to do it right, you just do it right all the time. That is perfectly well said. And it is true. Just keep doing it what you love all the time, consistent, consistent, and you'll just be good at it. Which actually kind of leads into my next question, which is another important one, which is in the field of tissue, as I'm learning in my field now as a freelance antiquity historian it is kind of a lonely feel in the sense that you're getting all this information doing all these projects and at some time feeling like am i actually really making a difference I, I, am i making an impact and we have those moments of reflection so i wanted to know matt have you ever had those moments of reflection thinking you know should i really be doing this or the opposite that i'm needed in this field this is my why this is why i'm doing what i'm doing oh i never had any doubts i this is what i wanted this is my life i mean if i was you know if i had this job taken away from me uh life would become immensely empty for me i mean really no really i mean it's it's total dedication um it's oh it's almost like faith in a sense it's like almost <laughs> I hate to say it's almost like being a priest. It is. It is. It is a commitment to faith, as it were. You, again, I, it's not about money. Yeah, I, I just I like I make a I make a decent living out of it. I'm not going to get rich from this, but that was never the idea. I just like doing what I'm doing. It's like it's like a challenge. It's like art. There is an art. It is an art to it. Um, when we do outreach. Um, uh, in the beginning, years ago, I used to do curation of like public exhibits. We used to have a public exhibits program. Like I remember I did this thing uh, 21 years ago, 21, 22 years ago. We featured uh, our architectural drawings of our lighthouse collection. We actually have architectural drawings of some famous hot lighthouses like the Cape Henry Lighthouse in Virginia, the ones in Hatteras, the Outer Banks ones. Mm -hmm. uh, don't laugh, some of those uh, lighthouses asked for copies of our architectural drawings because they were doing restoration work. 
I mean, the famous ones in the Outer Banks. Yes, yes. And we did. We made copies of those um, of those large art because uh, we have scanners. We have machines that can do digital scans, actual photocopies of those massive architectural drawings. And we sent them to the appropriate facility. And yeah, we aided in preservation work of those famous lighthouses there. And we did an exhibit of them. We have some famous ones in Maryland, like the Thomas Point one. And I remember we had a display for one year, we had an exhibit and the people came in and I still have the book of comments from those people. They, oh, lighthouse enthusiasts are, are almost international and they were thrilled wow. looking at what we had there, you know, of those drawings there. And we, you know, uh, photographs, because not just architectural drawings, utilizing the facilities of the still pictures branch at the national archives facility in college park maryland we were able to get some good old vintage photographs of some famous lighthouses like sandy point in maryland and uh uh um uh, 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 what's that one in north carolina uh cape fear the old cape fear uh. light in north carolina and various other ones too you know ones in the jersey shore like barnegan and abseek and very old vintage like from the 20s or the 30s or or whatever, you know, and we put that up on display too, showing just what the archives does, because it's not just documents. Uh, we have an, a, an, a satellite facility in College Park, Maryland, with it, right next to the University of Maryland campus. We not just documents, we also have motion pictures, still pictures, uh, maps and charts, our cartographic branch. Uh, you know, we have the full spectrum of archival records there and uh, if you go online and look up our archival catalog where every day we're updating that catalog the balloon is constantly expanding Whoa. we have here you know national park service records of you know of some famous uh, uh, park service sites throughout the whole country there i mean if you're genuinely dedicated to research you just go to the NARA catalog and every day there's always something new and so I always keep people, to, we're not, the catalog's not static. It's the balloon grows and will keep growing. As long as there's a national archives, that, what we know, what we have, because we're constantly digging, trying to figure out what we have. I mean, what we have described and what we actually have, there's an enormous difference. I mean, we're always catching up, trying to figure out what are the contents of our records, what case files, what we do have and what we don't have. We, we, our facility here in Philadelphia, we have some landmark, uh, case files, civil case files, criminal case files. Like the other day I was helping a colleague of mine pulling a famous mafia case for a company, a company. It was about the Stanford Merlino mafia war of 1992 to 1994. We actually have the criminal case file. And we're, we're helping out a documentary uh, company uh, doing work on that, a, 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 a documentary about that specific mafia war. Wow. And that actually kind of leads into my next question, which is, what was probably your favorite, or what is probably your favorite piece of artifact history that you have found that just like whoa, that is blows your mind? Well, we we do have some treasures there that we keep under lock and key. We security is a must. Um, some in our facilities have been victimized by theft, people pilfering famous documents like uh, mm. presidential pardons. I mean, these are actual pardons with the actual signatures of a president from Abraham Lincoln or President Grant or Rutherford B. Hayes. Yeah, sometimes wow. that happens. So we have to go through stringent security measures. We do have like a safe that even I have no access to the safe. But for instance, mm. in one of our in our safe at my facility is an actual certificate appointing a man named Voigt to be chief corner of the United States Mint dated in 1792, pre signed by President George Washington. Wow. Holy yeah. mackerel. I can't even imagine seeing that and seeing the signature. It's like a historian's like, dream to see like an artifact of the past. Yeah. I mean, and you know that and you've seen it. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. kind of like almost like the next question leading to that. Um, what museum... And your opinion has been like the most fun to like work with in terms of like outreach projects and exhibits. Not much. Uh, hmm. Interacting with other facilities. Hmm. Uh, not really. We we really. Kind of, yeah, we're not. No, we're not. Not much in the way our my specific facility. Not really in terms of collaborative work. Not really. Uh, hmm. I know when you're like thirty some years ago, we helped. Um, some like uh, some ag local agencies put up some exhibit stuff, 
but we don't really do that now. COVID-19 really kind of kicked that into a cocked hat. And also we're very wow. small staff and we're very, you know, we have so many work projects. It's very hard to do real genuine collaborative work with other agencies in that sense, as far as I can tell. Okay. Okay. That, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I, mean, no, I, I wanted to caution this. There is some like collaborative thing with like, uh, the archives at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and also at West Point. There's some type of uh, affiliate called affiliated archives. Okay. Mm. Yeah. You know, they're not part of the narrow network, but there is like a semi collaboration there. You know, oh, we kind of help okay. each other out, but they're not officially part of the narrow orbit. No, no. But we do uh -huh. have, that. yeah, it's a friendship, nice. it's a friendly collaboration, as it were. But in terms of the liaison, nothing really super close, but they are affiliated with us. Nice. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And so now kind of almost like another per uh, personal question before you get into um, the other questions. So for Matt, growing up, who would you say has been like your biggest role models in the pursuit of studying history? Well, in terms of books that I used to read, um, I remember we had the 11 volumes of Will and Ariel's History of Western Civilization. That was fascinating. The Bruce Catton Civil War books. Um, hmm. uh, huh, other you know, it's the works of Stephen Ambrose. I always love the works of Stephen Ambrose. I have a wide variety of stuff there. That kind of you know fed my arc, uh, the historical archival urge. Watching those documentaries and seeing the National Archives being cited as a source for various things of that nature, that was very much you know, very inspirational in terms of you know just feeding, fueling my desires. Nice. What about any uh, college professors? Was there any college professors that really stuck out to you that helped mold you into the historian that you are now? Hmm. Uh... None really comes to mind. Not really. I just, I didn't really need someone else to motivate me for it. I was always motivating myself. I, I, I just wanted it. I just wanted to get my degrees and then get my foot in some archival museum door and then just tear me, turn me loose. Really? Okay. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, just so... Now going to the next set of questions, these set of questions are now on your side of being um, an author too, based on your uh, bio. So yeah. for listeners who remember the introduction, uh, Matt is also an author of four pieces. Congratulations on that, Matt. So okay. when did you decide to get your hand um, into writing? And was this around the same time you were um, working on history or did that come later in your life? I began, I began writing when I was 17 years old. Uh, at the time, I was mostly writing uh, song lyrics and poetry. Um, it was sort of a way, uh, I'm not going to bore people with the, the, the gross details, but I sort of had like a painful childhood. And also the local school system where I was going to was not exactly a good one. So mm. it was a very painful experience. And I began writing as a form of like, coping with my inner emotions, as it were. It was kind of like a healing mechanism. If I hadn't right. had my writing, I think my life would have turned out very differently and not very good in that sense. It probably would have led to some very unfortunate or mis misfortunate areas in that sense. So in a sense, writing saved my life in a certain way, emotionally and artistically in that sense. And I continue, I've always been writing song lyrics and poetry since that time. And then uh, when I started, uh, when I was in college, and then especially in grad school, I was an op-ed columnist at my college newspaper, the, the Gleaner at Rutgers Camden University from 87, 89. I was kind of doing like a poor man's version of Walter Lippmann, who was one of the great op-ed columnists of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. I mean, very influential. And I was pretending to be this, you know, <laughs> you know intellectual op-ed columnist type. But it was a very fun exercise. I, I was given the freedom basically to basically write whatever I wanted. So <laughs> there was week after week, semester after semester, just writing. It could have been presidential politics. It could be about think pieces. It could be uh, commenting about sports history or uh, some uh, event in history, something like that. I remember writing something about William of Ockham, 
about Munich, 1938, or Mike Tyson. It was just whatever came into my head, whatever inspired me. And it was, and it really helped me expand. And now I was no longer writing poetry or song lyrics. Now I'm writing prose. That really helped me out. It really built me up. And there were times when I was, some of my columns, I would submit columns to like local area newspapers, like the Camden Courier Post or the Berman County Times. They reprinted it. But I tried also for the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is a really major metropolitan newspaper. And that right. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Oh, oh. and piffle, you know. But like smaller newspapers, yeah, I got some exposure. And there were times I got some good feedback. I remember writing a piece about Malcolm X in 1990. And I had some people at college come up to me, oh, that was a beautiful thing that you did. Someone told me the guy cut the thing out up and pasted it to the walls of his barber shop. Wow. wow. Wow, man, <laughs> there, this was around the time there was this greater exposure. You were seeing documentaries about Malcolm X and then Spike Lee came out with his famous movie with Denzel Washington about Malcolm X. So it was right. just before that, but there was that greater awareness about Malcolm uh, around 1990 thereabouts and all that. Yeah. Fascinating. And then it kind of laid fallow. And then uh, in the 2000s, mid 2000s, I still working on an abortive oral history of the NHL's original six era from 1942 to 67, when there were only six teams in the National Hockey League. And I was traveling around Canada, you know, and I interviewed some immortal players there, but it never got off the ground and I never completed it. But then I used some of the material from that oral history project to uh, work on what came, what came to my first book, Bench Bosses, the NHL's coaching elite. I, influenced by Bill James, the great baseball historian, and someone else, I, I, I decided to see, could you do something like that, evaluate who were the greatest National Hockey League coaches of all time? Because I looked it up. No one had ever done that before. I mean, who was mm. truly greater, like yeah. Scotty Bowman or Toe Blake or Punch Imlock? I mean, no one had ever Probably. done that. So I devised a rating system. And I ran all the NHL coaches at that time through that system. And the end product is what's up on Amazon right now, Bench Bosses, the NHL Coaching Elite. I finished writing it in 2013. And then I started hawking it uh, to various uh, publishing houses. I actually got an agent who was interested in the project. And then suddenly- Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Um, he worked on it and he actually got a commitment from Penguin Random House Canada. They agreed to publish it. And I submitted the manuscript in 2013, but there was like a delay. And finally, October 2015 was the official release date of the book. And it came out. That was my first book. Uh, it was. Uh, and then two years later, I started working on another uh, groundbreaking project. No one had ever done this before. I decided to look at National Hockey League general managers. Had anyone ever? Mm. Uh, who the greatest general managers of all time? I mean, was it... Um, was it Sam Pollock, the late Sam Pollock, or could it be Glenn Sather, or could it be Ooh, okay. uh, Jack Adams, you know, and all that. And I, again, using the same rating system for my coaches, I ran all the NHL GMs through that system. And the end product, which came out October, 2017, is the art of the dealers, the NHL's greatest general managers. It was a groundbreaking work. I mean, imagine no one had ever tried to evaluate general managers in any of the four major North American sports, which is baseball, right. football, NBA basketball, or NHL hockey. I mean, imagine if someone did that for Major League Baseball. I mean, who was greater? You know, Branch Rickey or George right. Wallace or heck, Billy Bean, who's made famous in that movie Moneyball. Okay. Right. No one's ever done it. I mean, if I live long enough, maybe I might tackle that, you know, down the road, ne maybe next decade if I'm still breathing and all of that. Because I'm 60. I mean, I just turned 60 last August, so I'm no spring chicken, you know. And I got a lot of book projects. Yeah, I want to take care of the interim and all that. So that was my second book. Two years after that, I came out with my third book, which was another groundbreaking work titled Lords of the Gridiron, college football's greatest coaches. Because again, no one had ever to rate the greatest Division One A college football coaches, the big schools, not the little schools like Division Two or Division right. Three, Division One A, the elite schools, using a rating system. But I devised it using four standards. It was a composite rating system, and uh, the end product came out uh, in September 2019, and. 
if you buy my book, Lords of the Grid are in college football's greatest coaches, you'll know who was greater. You know, could it be Nick Saban or could it be Bear Bryant or Barry Switzer or Joe Paterno? I mean, you want the answer? Buy, but please buy my book because no one else. <laughs> That I uh, Gabe, I have this motto when as an author, history abhors a vacuum. And what I try to do with my book project is fill those voids, those vacuums in sports history where no one ever trod before. I, that, uh, and because um, now my fourth book, which just came out in 2022, Lords of the Gridiron, two pro football's greatest coaches. Technically not groundbreaking because uh, another uh, author named Sean Lehman, he came out of a book uh, called the Pro, Fo Pro Football Historical Abstract in 07. And he had a chapter devoted using his uh, a, a system of his own rating the great coaches. However, I had a little technical complaints about his system. I thought there were some flaws there. I came up uh, okay. with an innovation where uh, also the same with Bill James, he came out a book about the about the great baseball managers. But my innovation is if you can quantify success, my discovery was you can also quantify failure. So what I did was I created a, a metrical rating system where you not only can track success, there's almost, it's kind of like a plus minus system. There are also right. standards of failure. Like if you are, your, your winning percentage is like 475, you only lose X amount of points, whereas if your, your winning percentage was only 397, you're going to lose a lot more points. And if you finish in last place, you're going to lose a lot more points, whereas as opposed to finishing in first place where you're going to get a lot of points. It's mm -hmm. it out. It's symmetrical. And that's what I did for my second, third, and fourth books. I created a, a, a composite system, a plus minus system to evaluate coaching talent. Like in my college football book, you lost points if you lost a minor bowl game and you lost even more points if you lost a major bowl game. Like Bo Schembechler of Michigan, you know, he lost a lot of Rose Bowls and that really damaged his stature in the eyes of my rating system. I got him in like the top 40s, not exactly top 10, you know, like a person mm. plays in that sense. I mean, if you won a lot of bowl games, that means you ranked very high but if you lost a lot of bowl games now nope, that dragged you down so it was always you know if you succeeded you know you would go you would rank high up in that sense wow that's and actually really cool football too uh, you know i had a debit system like if you won the super bowl you got a lot of points but if you lost the super bowl like just last night you know right Shanahan, you know he lost points simply because he lost his second super bowl game that kind of Put him down a little bit whereas andy reed boy he really leapfrogged higher into my system mm -hmm. so like with my pro football book you've got all the great coaches featured in there paul brown bill belichick vince lombardi tom landry i mean if you want to know where they rank against each other please ladies and gentlemen go out and get my book all of my books are up on amazon you can order it online. Mostly, you can order online. Only my first book was available in stores. Uh, I self-published my uh, my last three books using um, what is now called KDP, Kindle Digital Publishing, and yes. all that. And I will do so with my up my upcoming book, which is Patriarchs of the Dugout: Baseball's Greatest Managers, which I hope mm. to release, God willing, in April 2026. Nice. So you're already on a roll with all your books, and I can clearly see you are very, very passionate about sports history. And yeah. it kind of leads into the next set of questions, which is for the first one, which pertains to your books. What uh, is the overall? What was the overall feedback uh, when you published your first book? And has the feedback stayed the same with your uh, books now? And leading into sports history. Um, what area of sports history would you want to study in a broad sense or any more specific category for specific sports? Uh, in terms of feedback, it is you've mostly been positive. I've had I've not really had any negative reviews. Um, I'll tell you one instance. My second book, uh, uh, The Art of the Dealers, the NHL's Greatest General Managers, I actually had he is presently the general manager of the Peterborough Peets in the Ottawa the entire Ontario Hockey League, one of the most elite Canadian junior hockey teams. He also teaches an online course about a course on hockey team management. And about a year or so ago, he reached out to me and said, Matt, I'd like to use your book 
as required reading for my online class. May I please have really? permission? Really? And of course, I gladly extended permission. Wow. And, and since then, um, you know, his students ordered the book because in my book, you actually have the great GMs, active and inactive, uh, describing this is what this is what it takes to be a great NHL general manager. When to make a trade, when not to make a trade, how to sign free agents, you know, basically a how-to about this is how the great men did it. We're bailing, building some of the greatest hockey teams in NHL history. Wow, that is incredible. I can imagine reading that response like, oh, you actually want to use my book as a required reading? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my my fantasy, Gabe, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but I would give anything – to be asked by an HBO sports documentary or an ESPN 30 for 30 or by a Ken Burns documentary to be an expert talking head about, you know, a famous coach or whatever. I would give anything for that, but it hasn't happened yet. But I know, dream on, dream on. <laughs> oh, man, you touched on an old dream of mine. That's all, That's been my thing um, as well, yeah. being like yeah. a talk head and like a documentary for like military history or age of antiquities because – yeah. Who doesn't love just seeing like a role of experts talking about yeah. what they love, their fields, their interests, yeah. and yeah. then going back to the sports history, um, what yeah. area of sports history would you want to cover or would you want to cover the history that you've already talked about uh, in your books and expand on it? Well, when I was a kid, I was a baseball nut, but I have since, I just love sports history as a whole. And I think I think as decades, when I was a kid, there wasn't really much of a niche for sports history. But now, as sports gets older and older, I mean, you are seeing greater specialization. You are seeing these documentaries about there is an audience for a real good sports documentary there. You know, mm -hmm. the Michael Jordan thing, the Tom Brady stuff, the ESPN 30 for 30s. I mean, it's like I always like good watching a good ESPN 30 for 30. I mean, it really fills a niche there about seeing the great athletes talk about those magnificent moments there, getting insight, what goes through your head when you're hitting the home run or sinking the basket or shooting, sh scoring a goal or whatever, you know, what was it about those great teams? There is a greater awareness. I mean, you're seeing uh, colleges teaching that there, it, there's curricula about that. You, you, if you wanted to talk about the history of baseball or football or, or whatever, you know, it, 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 so it, it, there, there is specialization. There is a, there is a niche there. It's expanding. There is an, a form of expertise there. And I'm like, I'm doing, I am trying to fill those niches that, you know, who, who really was the greatest? My book, even if you don't accept it as the gospel truth, it's still a frame of reference if someone else wanted to build a better match, uh, build a better mousetrap or a build a better light bulb or whatever. Okay. Right. You could still use my book as a frame of reference, you know, either to prove or disprove. Okay. And it's, it's, it, I'm trying to fill that niche there. I mean, if you were truly curious, okay, who really was greater, Joe Paterno or Bear Bryant, my book would give you an answer, or at least give you a notion to go on, even if you didn't agree with the conclusion. If you can find a better method, okay, good good luck and God bless. But if you like what I'm doing, well, thank you very much too, okay? I mean, <laughs> every time I get a book sale, which I track almost every day online, when I see one, I think, thank you. I mean, somebody up there likes me, you know? Now someone out there, it's just, it's it's an affirmation. I'm, I'm just, I don't care. I mean, none of my stuff ever made New York Times bestseller, but even that wasn't the, the idea of it. It's just, someone is deriving joy at least you know learning something from my book that, that to me is a thrill i remember when i checked online uh, canadian libraries were, were had my book on their stacks there and i just smiled and i said thank you that was a real wish come true for me that uh, my book would be in some library in some distant land or something like that I, to me right. that's a, the form of immortality even when i die my books will be floating out there in the ether, you know, somewhere down the road might buy my book. I mean, it's just, at least, I mean, I have no children. So in a sense, those are my children. So in a sense, my name lives on. I know that sounds egotistical, but we authors do crave uh, immortality and, you know, and attention. <laughs> I 100% I agree. When, when I started writing my book, probably around the height of the pandemic, I was still in college in my master's program. Sure. And I've got my book published after five years of research and reading and writing and all that stuff. Yeah. 
And you're right, it is an incredible feeling because it is a sense of immortality because it's literally our words forever immortalized on a project. And you know, it is also true uh, for us authors. You know, we always want to reach a wide audience, and sometimes it's a hit or miss. But if yeah. we get a great following, we find people that enjoy our works, then that's the real sense of validation. It's not the seal. It's not the news. It's people who enjoy our works and leaving the reviews. That is what is the real joy. Yeah. And we're now coming towards the end of the interview match. So probably my last major question I wanted to ask you is, what is your word of wisdom to other historians who want to get into this field that you're in, what is your advice to them? Okay, if your university has a public history program, like when I went to Rutgers Camden, I was one of the first students at their public history program, which was just introduced into their curriculum and their, and their graduate school program. I was one of the first students there. And so if your university has a public history program, make your, use it, utilize it, or find a university clo close to you that had and emphasizes public history, which teaches you how to work in an archival field. Get your, focus your educational, your graduate skills on that. Get your degree in that. And then uh, do like I did. I was doing volunteer work at the National Archives of Philadelphia before I got my job. I was doing various projects there. And then there was a vacancy. I applied for it and phew, thank God. I finally got it, and whew, man, <laughs> you know, and and I, ever since then, I've never looked back. Do volunteer work, build, put that into your resume. That really looks good. That the fact that you're being exposed to archival records, it, even if it's not a National Archives facility, work at a historical society, some type of you know local you know historical thing or a a, a, a public a, a, like a museum site, a, a, like a, a National Park Service site, doing volunteer work. Or a state park, or or a, a county, uh, you know, a county park, or or, or a, a, a a state archive. You know, if they have a volunteer programs, you utilize it. Put it up on your resume. That gives you better odds in getting a job at at an official job at an archive. You know, a, a state or a local archive or a historical society or uh, some are our corporate archive, you know, they, they, right. they, the corporate angle too. They, they do things, you know, the big companies, you know, there's even private archival storage like Iron Mountain and various other facilities. Look it up, you know, uh, check it out, you know, uh, corporate archives or industrial archives, see if they got any slots there. Get exposure, get exposure. Uh, some of our our latest employees at National Archives only came from the National Park Service. Yeah, they, tra they crossed over there. Maybe that might be a thing. Try to get a job in the National Park Service and then see if you can cross over to the National Archives. Do it that way, because uh, our last couple hires that came from the National Park Service. Yeah. Nice. Very, yes. very nice. And Try to get some exposure. Be helpful, especially if the thing you're helping out as a volunteer is it got a vacancy. They remember, okay, yeah, he or she is doing good work. Okay. <laughs> hey, seriously, hey, you know, hey, yeah. It's true, it's true. So pretty much at the end of the day, market yourself, branch out yourself, make connections, and who knows? The people that you connect with, the people you volunteer and about, they'll probably remember you and they'll probably have something for you, which ultimately, yeah. at the end of the day, that's what we historians do. We branch, we connect, and... That's how we stay in big circles. That is 100% true. Yep, that's right, Gabe. You got it. <laughs> well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed this wonderful interview. Again, I want to thank our guest, uh, Matt, for joining us. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. And before we officially end, where can people find and engage with you to know more about any works you're going to be a part of, any events you're going to be assisting, and where to find your uh, books again? Okay, all of my books are can be purchased online at Amazon. Just type in my name, Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, D-B-I-S, D as in David, small i, B as in Baker, small i, A as in Abel, S as in Sam, E as in Edward, and you will see my books. Uh, you can purchase them. So I put them on uh, what peer lock like during hockey season or NFL season or college football season. I put them on sale right now. The NFL season and college football season are over, so they're not on sale. But if you wait till like when you know come summertime September, they'll be on sale at thirty percent off. You can wait till then. Purchase it for Christmas. 
Yeah, uh, that's that's right there. Um, they do great. You know, just put in put put in your purchase and enjoy reading it. I also have a podcast. Uh, I have been a podcaster. I'm now in my fifth season. It's called the Package Tourist. I do it on Spotify. I tape uh, usually Tuesday evenings at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, right after about 1030, I post it online the same evening, about minutes later. Uh, You can just type in the package source and you can listen to my shows. If you are an author who is looking for exposure of your works, please reach out to me. I have a profile on LinkedIn. I mean, that's how you and I live. I got together Mm -hmm. together LinkedIn. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Please reach out to me on Facebook. You can send me a friend request. They're saying, Matt, I'm an author. I'd love to be on your show. And uh, I right now, I'm almost fully booked for my fifth season. But down the road, if I find an empty slot, I would love to have you on the show. I interview authors of all stripes from historians to poets uh, to novelists, whether it's like Christian romance novelists uh, to mystery novelists. Uh, I cover the full spectrum of literary activity from history to nonfiction, you name it, uh, horror, you know, fast sci-fi. I, I, I love to hear from you. Academics, you know, I like to cover the waterfront and I would love to have you on my show. And I love to give people exposure because like I said, our, self, our self-published authors do crave exposure. So yes. I'm sympathetic. I've, I've had a lot of authors and authoresses who have been self-published and I love to help them out because I, I, I would wish the same for you. That's why I'm gay, uh, grateful for you, Gabe, you know, for get, allowing me to be on the show here. I'm definitely, definitely deeply grateful. And anytime you want me back, I'd love to help out. Okay. Of course, man, of course. And 100% agree. I 100% agree with everything you said. So I will link all those down below. Matt's podcasts, his books, LinkedIn, Facebook to reach out to him. He's a great guy, great person. And if you want to know more about this and want to know more about being an archivist and how to get into, you can private message Matt on Facebook or LinkedIn and just go from there. And again, listeners... Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, thank you to Matt. You've been a wonderful guest. I thank you so very much. And I wish you all the best going forward in your podcast, your books, and future works. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Gabe. May God bless and keep you always. Thank you, Matt. And for you as well. And listeners, be on the lookout for the last few episodes coming out later this month. And I hope you enjoy. And this has been The Wandering Scribe and The Wandering Quill, signing out.